So I was asked to speak today on this is what I want from my revascularization colleagues. So realistically, when we look at our current wound healing guidelines, the, the ACC guidelines suggest that um, wound healing for patients with critical limb ischemia should involve an interdisciplinary team that evaluates, provides comprehensive care for the patient um, with CLI and tissue loss to achieve complete wound healing in a functional foot. And that after we get our uh, uh, revascularization, wound he uh, healing progresses with the intent of complete wound healing and, and again, functional uh, ambulation. Um, it suggests that, that uh, patients with CLI, revascularization is done to minimize uh, tissue loss and that um, evaluation by an interdisciplinary team before amputation is really warranted. And that's all well and good. It also goes on to say, well, who is that care team? And it gives us recommendations. That care team is mu very much a multidisciplinary team, and it includes the vascular specialist, but also nurses, orthopedic surgeons, endocrinologists, internal medicine specialists, and the list goes on. So realistically, um, from my approach, when you have a true wound healing team, it takes a village, right? And there are a lot of people that we work with every single day. From a professional standpoint, we work with vascular medicine, podiatry, vascular surgery, plastic surgery, general surgery, internal medicine. We rely on our reperfusion specialist, including cardiology, vascular surgery, and radiology. There's a lot of ancillary medicine support. We rely on the internist. We need to, to have their support infectious disease, endocrinology for our patients with, with diabetes and nephrology, rheumatology, and then surgical support outside of that from orthopedics, podiatry, colorectal, plastics, the list goes on. But even more importantly, we have all of our other ancillary support, and this is all equally important. So the professionals at the top see, sometimes don't remember that there's a lot of nursing support that goes in. We are critically dependent on the information we get from our vascular laboratory technicians. Home health care and DME, which every patient really relies on. Our orthotist, our pet orthotist, and our prosthetist, who we don't have as much contact with, but you certainly have to have a good one. And if you don't have a good one, life becomes much more difficult. Our dietitian, nutritional counseling, our physical therapists, our lymphedema therapists, and then above and beyond that, at the end of the day, right, there's our administrative support, our billers and our coders, and even our environmental support that has to get involved to make sure everything goes smoothly. So realistically, we have this really nice idea of what our team is. When we're in the wound clinic, this is what it looks like, right? There are days when it really seems like complete chaos. Now, at the end of the day, it all gets done. Our patients benefit from our care but we're left with this, right? And so at the back side of this, what do we need from all of our other support people? Well, we need, we need a little help. We need communication, right? So what do I need from my revascularization colleagues? I wanna know if and when a procedure is planned and any anticipated delays, right? If I tell my patient, you're gonna see somebody next week and next week turns out not to be next week, I need to have an explanation for that. What's the referral process? How do I get somebody in if it's an acute limb versus if it's critical limb ischemia where time is still of an essence or if it's more of a routine procedure and I need an angio, I need runoff, I've got somebody who may just be a claudicant, et cetera. Is there a contact person? Is there a process? Do I go through the NP? Do I go through the secretary? Do I go through the cath lab? Do I have to call directly to who knows who? Do you want to see the patient first? Obviously with ALI and most of the time with CLI, that's not necessarily always feasible. But do you want to see somebody first if it's an opportunity? And when the patient comes in on your service or comes into the hospital, who's primary on the service? Do they get admitted to medicine? Is there a cardiology team? Is it the interventional radiologist bringing the patient in and it goes to the unit? Who's my main players? And please, please, please notify me when my patient is in the hospital. Because even if I'm not consulted, even if they don't need me that day, I will stop by and say hello, right? I see these patients every other week or every three weeks, and it's important for them to know that I'm still involved. On the other side of that, back end of the, of the procedure, keep me in the loop. Was the procedure successful? Do I have inline flow? Do I have angiosome flow? Even better, right? Or do I have a very tenuous runoff where I have to be worried about that toe, that forefoot, that revascularization 
every time I see the patient. What are the recommendations that the patient's going to be following after the procedure? Is the patient on DAPT? Did they require anticoagulation? How long would you like to have that on board? Are we looking at three uh, months or 30 days? Or is this something that, because it's very tenuous, should be indefinite? What are the surveillance requirements? So if the patient falls off that surveillance pathway, I can get them back on. But if I don't know what it is, I can't help. And what are required labs? If you think you may have used a little too much contrast and I need to look at the kidney function, please let me know. If there was a little extra hemoglobin left on the floor at the end of the day, let me know. I will take a look at the CBC. I'll make sure we're all on the same page. Should there other procedures be delayed for some reason? Did you do something that you don't want me to immediately debride this patient or immediately send them to amputation? or anticipate doing any other grafting or anything else. Because I can generally wait, but I need to know. And did something unplanned happen? Nothing worse than having the patient come back and say, oh yeah, Dr. So-and-so said this happened. And if I don't know about it, right, now I'm, I'm, I'm going back. I'm trying to find the op report, I'm trying to find the note, something happened, something didn't go the way it should have gone, et cetera. So, we have guidelines for follow-up. Right? Unfortunately, these guidelines are very amorphous. We need to follow up the patient. That's really what they say, right? It doesn't give you time frames. It doesn't give you any guidelines or any structure. So again, communicate those anticipated guidelines and those anticipated follow-ups to me, and I will be happy to help. So at the end of the day, what do I want? What do I need? It really comes down to communication. Just tell me where you're at. So every team needs a captain. Every player on the team is important. Doesn't matter what the role that player is playing. Everybody at the end of the day has the same goal. And winning through limb salvage really is everything. To me, to the patient. I hate to walk into the patient and say, I lost the game. Because we're gonna lose a leg, a toe, a foot. It doesn't matter, I don't like to lose. So when I spend my day, like the left-hand side of the slide here, and then I give a handoff and I'm left standing completely bewildered with what happened, it doesn't leave me with very good feelings. So what do I need? That's what I need from my wound, from my revascularization folks. Thank you. All right, next up we have uh, Dr. Michael Meyer who's gonna uh, talk to us about the ABCs of wound healing. All right, so my disclosures are as listed, or were listed. Um, so the ABCs of wound care connotates simplicity. Uh, and nine times out of 10, pictures are simple. So this is kind of a pictorial representation of some of the basics of wound management. Uh, there my disclosures actually are. So uh, when we look at wound healing and the basics thereof, I think everything starts foundationally upon an accurate diagnosis. Wounds are a finding, but you have to have an accurate diagnosis in order to achieve balance of healing. And that balance occurs by juggling a number of different factors, certainly as reflected in this meeting, optimizing perfusion in a timely fashion, controlling edema, controlling infection, certainly performing appropriate wound debridement, offloading pressure points, accomplishing moisture balance or moist healing, and overall disease management. You can certainly add to this list by no means is it complete, uh, but ironically, Dr. Carmen and I didn't collaborate on our slides ahead of time, but if you think it's juggling, it is, a lot of factors. So sifting those things out certainly becomes important when it comes to basics. So certainly a basic is that of perfusion. When we look at arterial ischemic ulceration, classically these are full thickness ulcers with a punched out appearance, may or may not have fibrinous or fibronecrotic debris in the base, uh, can oftentimes occur over bony prominences and, and can be very painful. The, the obvious caveat there is the diabetic patient with neuropathy, but these are examples of wounds that occurred from ill-fitting shoe gear in the setting of previously undiagnosed arterial disease. So the next question becomes, in terms of things like referring to our vascular colleagues, what about the timing of such? Well, an example here pictorially is a 63-year-old diabetic man who presented with a painful toe blister, uh, kind of unclear as to the, the uh, nuts and bolts of how this occurred, duration, onset, those types of things, uh, but he said it hurt, so it prompted a visit. In any case, uh, you can see it has a fairly cyanotic appearance to it, and if we look at non-invasive studies uh, in the proximal aspect of the leg, it doesn't look too bad. As we move down towards the ankle, we get a different sense 
uh, in a diabetic with calcified vessels. And then we look at distal perfusion in terms of transmetatarsal and digital tracings and, and digital PPGs. You can see that indicates he probably has some degree of tibial vessel disease, and that's certainly echoed by the toe brachial index of 0.23. So that timing piece becomes critical. So that fairly non-innocuous looking toe, uh, despite multiple attempts to revascularize severe infrapopliteal arterial disease, this gentleman actually develops ischemic breast pain, goes on to an isolated fourth toe amputation, unfortunately though a marked decline in a four week period such that he went on to a transtibial amputation. So timing is certainly an issue when it comes to the basics of management. We can't just wound careize patients like this, so that timely referral uh, and follow up is critically important. Now what about the opposite end of the spectrum for timing? A 68 year old diabetic man, multiple comorbid factors including ischemic cardiomyopathy, heart failure, previous MI, AFib, coronary disease, as well as valvular heart disease. But he had tissue loss on his wounds that had been present for many, many months. You can see these fairly well circumscribed defects, but he also had severe chronic pain that previous providers had chalked up to his multifactorial edema. Well, being dutiful, acknowledging risk factors for PAD and the, the individual features of the wounds, we went ahead and got non-invasive studies, and clearly this gentleman has severe occlusive inflow disease. And when you look at him angiographically, he was reconstructed in the aorta iliac segment, um, with uh, endovascular strategies. And then post-procedurally, you can see now his tracings are markedly improved and he's actually normalized his ABIs. Now then we can actually go after that pain and swelling component with appropriate local wound care and debridement. And after a little over three months, he has not only complete resolution of that edema, but complete resolution of that pain, again, not chalked up to edema, but ischemic rest pain. So the timing was different here. We had the luxury of time uh, in this situation, but the common thread was that arterial disease. Another aspect of basic of management is that of edema control. And classically, when you think about edema control, we think about venous states and venous disease. And Dr. Kalori is going to speak to mixed presentations. But the classic venous stasis ulcer is as pictured here. And we do things like compression therapy to reduce volume. So a variety of different wraps and stockings, et cetera. And when patients come back, they sometimes complain. But it's desirable to see those skin folds when we reduce that interstitial volume. But it can also be important to recognize edema outside of classic venous disease. So what's pictured here is a 93-year-old gentleman who comes in with tissue loss directly over the medial malleolus, extremely painful, over a bony prominence, a uh, history of remote above knee amputation on the opposite side, has an ulcer present for a, the better part of three months, and unfortunately had been treated with a couple courses of antibiotics and wound careized. But the teaching point here was to really think about risk factors, and certainly everything under the sun points to peripheral arterial occlusive disease, but on exam he had an intact pedal pulse. So one of the most important things, the physical exam is king, and then taking that good history and physical exam uh, to the next level, asking the right questions, you get the answers you seek. Instead of severe occlusive disease, this was simply a matter of a traumatically induced skin ulcer in the setting of uncontrolled dependent edema in a non-ambulator. So with some appropriate local debridement and wound care and elasticated compression and more consistent leg elevation, he had marked improvement in a short period of time. So again, edema control alone can play an important role. Now another basic is that of infection, and I'm certainly preaching to the choir when we think about patients with wounds uh, and those that take care of them. The classic features as listed with erythema, calor, tissue edema, increased drainage, pain again, perhaps not in the diabetic patient, certainly, and then more closely looking, fluctuance and depth. When you take a look at a wound such as this, clearly a fairly unhealthy looking wound with a lot of focal erythema and associated calor. And it's important to remember to look with one's hands, not with just one's eyes. When we probe this wound, there's actually a track that communicates, and then probing deep actually reveals extension to the level of bone and joint. So unfortunately, this patient doesn't just have superficial wounds. Uh, this actually extends to the level of the cuboid with associated osteomyelitis. And another critical component when it comes to infection and infection control are this that of cultures. More often than not, those superficial cultures are not going to be reliable identifying true pathogens, so deep tissue cultures, uh, whenever possible, is certainly the gold standard. There's also basics when it comes to infection control with dressings. A lot of dressings are marked that they're good for a certain amount of time, but not to leave those in, in place for extended periods and to adjust the frequency of change according to the volume of drainage. It sounds trivial, but it's like a kid with a dirty diaper. How often do you change it? As often as needed. The same could be said of wound care. So you can see here a fully dissolved uh, alginate type dressing that had been left in place too long. We didn't change anything other than the frequency instead of every four to five days daily. And on first follow-up a couple of weeks later, a markedly looking different wound just by increasing the frequency of dressing change.
but we can also take advantage of imaging studies, and certainly we have a wide array of things from plain film radiographs through MRs and CTs to look for the extent of tissue involvement in bone. You can see radiographically a classic example of septic arthritis and osteomyelitis involving the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. And it translates clinically. This was an example of a patient who had had uh, non-traumatic partial first ray amputation due to uh, pedal ulceration and osteomyelitis. But it's important to remember sometimes that those clinical signs of infection are muted in diabetics patients, again, in the setting of neuropathy. So you can see a clearly, uh, a fairly unhealthy looking um, amputation site initially after it had dishissed. So radiographically though, at, at least an in initial presentation, reasonable appearance to the bone, kind of a nice linear appearance to that residual first metatarsal. But unfortunately, true to form, the patient decided not to come back for follow-up, followed up with his local provider, and came back months later with a chief complaint of having stubbed the second toe. And when asked about that non-healing amputation site, yeah, I've been putting some kind of gel or some such thing on it, and it hurts every now and then. But being dutiful and looking at imaging studies, you can see now radiographically, not only does the patient have evidence of osteomyelitis in the residual first metatarsal, but also in that adjacent second metatarsal phalangeal joint with septic arthritis. So those imaging studies prove very helpful, serially, especially in the setting of diabetes with neuropathy. And finally, offloading, uh, as a podiatrist, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. Certainly, we podiatrists look at things like structural deficits and abnormal mechanics and the creation of callus, which we may say is pre-ulcerative in nature and leads to that classic neuropathic ulceration, as you can see pictured on the right. But it's also important to remember some of the basics. We can't heal all wounds, and we do things like transmetatarsal amputations, but at the risk of stating the morbidly obvious, don't forget the opposite extremity, an example of a patient who didn't have appropriate fitting shoe gear and then went on to bilateral transmetatarsal amputation. Now, when it comes to specifics of offloading, the, the uh, time constraints here are, are inadequate to go over the, all of them, but some basics. Choice is based largely on ambulatory status and patient function. There are both a wide range of weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing devices, also for short and long-term use, a couple pictured offloading boots in the hospital. Certainly, the, the total contact cast is often referred to as the gold standard of taking the patient out of the equation with reducing pressure points. And finally, a whole host of orthotics and shoes with various modifications to reduce pressure points. So in conclusion, the ABCs of wound clear should include optimizing perfusion in a timely manner, certainly controlling edema, treating infection, and reducing pressure points. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Next up, we have uh, Dr. Mazai, who's going to talk to us about the hemodynamic assessment in critical limb ischemia and how to approach this. Thank you, Dr. Carmen. Thank you, panelists. Thank you for this kind invitation. It's an honor to be here, and I'm going to briefly skate over in the next six to eight minutes uh, on the hemodynamic assessment. None of my conflicts uh, are for this talk over here. So I think we, we all realize um, with this team effort, the goal is to m reduce mortality because, as we all know, that once a patient develops critical limb ischemia, one-fourth of them may not be living at the end of 12 months. And we want to reduce amputation because I think that's a disaster if we tell our patients that we are going to take your leg off. Some of my patients have told me that I wish you would have told me I had cancer or heart failure but not taking my leg off. And reduce functional disability. Many of these people are very active in their life and it will impact their uh, living. So hopefully with my talk, I can keep you out of getting into too much deep holes. This is just a brief uh, uh, showing <laughs> how we can stay out of that. Um, if you look at the um, uh, American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology, they have come with guidelines, and Dr. Carmen showed some of the slides. Uh, some of the tests that they are recommending, I just wanted to, I don't want you reading it. I know this is small, but ABI, TBIs, and uh, transcutaneous um, oxygen uh, pressure in the and skin perfusion pressure. Those are the few tests that they are recommending. And then finally, for diagnosis, they are rep recommending duplex ultrasound, CTA or MRA, and invasive angiography. And if you look at the guidelines, yes, for TBI and ABI, we definitely have level one, though non-randomized uh, level of evidence, B. But once we start going into some of these other tests for uh, oxygen tension and uh, skin perfusion pressure, we don't have that strong scientific evidence. It's 2A with the level of evidence B, non-randomized trials, but that's what the recommendations stand. So I'm going to briefly touch over some of these. I will also tell you what may be coming in the future, some of the advancements that are being made, and uh, 
and hopefully that will give you a nutshell idea. This is an ABI algorithm that we had developed and it's published in the, one of the interventional cardiology book which came out uh, last year by Samadhi and the group and the peripheral arterial disease chapter. Uh, this has the ABI algorithm. We basically look at ABI if technically performed good. If, if there's an error, then we, these numbers don't stand any validity. But if you, we think if the ABI is less than 0.7, our choice is we go for MRA. I personally think once you have an ABI at rest of point, less than 0.7, you will find significant disease. And my test of choice for imaging is MRA. Uh, some people like CTA and arterial duplex, but we get an MRA to define the anatomy. If the ABI runs between 0.7 to 1.3, some people will say 1.4, non-compressible. We do an exercise ABI, and if it plummets, it's, we think they, they, they need to proceed with an MRA because it's probably proximal iliac artery disease that is getting missed. And if the exercise ABI stays somewhere between 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, we, what is the history? Is it moderate to severe pain or, or significant limitation? You can do an arterial duplex, MRA, CTA, depending on what you clinically think. But if they only have mild symptoms or no limitation, you can repeat the ABI in a year's time. And if it's greater than 0 0.8 and less than 1.0, repeat in a year, you have the diagnosis of PAD, but you don't. And once it's greater than non-compressible, you know, 1.3 or 1.4, it's non-diagnostic and we'll proceed with an arterial duplex. When we are doing ABIs, we have the luxury of looking at the waveforms. So as you all know, that you have a nice triphasic waveform in normal vessel. When you see a normal even ABI with this waveform or this waveform, you can diagnose peripheral arterial disease from a mile away. I mean, these are significantly abnormal. At that point, the ABI number really doesn't matter. It's just that the vessels may be non-compressible and falsely giving you a normal ABI. Now, what is the American College and Heart Association recommending? They describe post-intervention ABI if it improves by 0 0.15. I will show you a paper that was uh, Shishim um, uh, Mehdi Shishabur published, which is hypothesis generating because it's not a large number of patients in that. And what they showed was that if you are looking at the probability of wound healing, ABI has to increase by greater than 0 0.23 if you do percutaneous intervention, not just 0 0.15, as compared to less than 0 0.23, then the probability of wound healing is less. This was not statistically uh, significant for amputation prediction. For amputation prediction, interestingly, they found toe brachial index. The toe brachial index should improve post-intervention from the baseline by greater than 0 0.21 if you really want to avoid amputation. That was a predictor. But again, I'm warning you, this is a small study. It's just hypothesis generating, and we will need larger studies. The unfortunate part is in, in, in vascular disease, we don't have great large number of uh, prospective randomized trials. Let's talk about pulse volume recording because at least not for vascular medicine and our podiatrist colleague, but many of the cardiologists, they get confused. They think pulse volume recording is the same as arterial Doppler. This is totally different. It's basically, I mean, when you put a cuff around the, uh, around the leg, when you inflate it, you're occluding the flow. The cuff has sensors. As soon as you're deflating, the first waveform that comes, that's called pulse volume recording. It's totally different when you do pulse wave or continuous wave arterial duplex. That's a totally different thing. So in pulse wave volume recording, it's the change that happens in the volume underneath the cuff when you inflate it. And when you're deflating, when that changes. And usually it's a rapid rise, slow fall with a dichroic notch. That's how a normal pulse volume recording looks like. And it, as the disease progresses, you will lose the dichroic notch, the systolic rise becomes slower, peak and delayed, and the flat and rounded, blunted. This is PVR. This is totally different from the waveform that I showed before, which was duplex. The problem is with PVRs, if it's not done properly, and this is from a referral center from another city when the patient came to us, when they don't put the cuffs properly, the PVRs are really hard to interpret. So it's not an easy test unless it's done properly, then you can. And with these segmental pressures, you can see it's a higher thigh, low thigh, below the knee, at the ankle, and you get toe brachial indexes. Okay, let's talk about transcutaneous oxygen tension a little bit over here. So when you are doing this thing, it's very simple to remember the number 40 millimeters mercury. If it's greater than 40 millimeters mercury, that is the transcutaneous oxygen tension in, underneath the skin. If it's greater than 40, the chances of wound healing are good. If it's less than 40, you do an oxygen challenge and you see how much rise there is. If you have greater than 100 millimeter rise increase in the oxygen tension, there's no significant vascular disease. However, if you think the, the oxygen tension does not go more than 30 millimeters, you probably have severe arterial disease. I don't use this. Probably some of my other colleagues probably use this in the clinic. Uh, 
I'm more relying on the EBIs and MREs. Let's talk about the skin perfusion pressure. The measurement of skin perfusion pressure with external compression, different techniques can be used, radioisotope clearance, platysmography, or laser Doppler, and basically you're seeing when the blood flow comes. And what's been shown is that your skin perfusion pressure, when it's 40 millimeters or greater, the sensitivity of this test in diagnosing PAD is 72%, specificity is 88%. And the chances of the wound healing, it has been shown in a very nice paper about 10 years back, it was published, if you take both of those, that is greater than 40 millimeter mercury was able to predict wound healing more accurately when combined with the, uh, the, 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 t tension, uh, the oxygen tension greater than 30 millimeters of mercury. Now what is coming in the future, they are working with CT and MR to see if they can do perfusion scanning and evaluate this chemical link for perfusion of the wound healing. And this was an interesting study which was published on 10 patients, I don't know where it stands now, but they injected these microsensors and it, this went and these microsensors embedded underneath the, the skin and they stayed over there and they could measure the microoxygen sensors, the MOXIE study. But hopefully they will come out where patients can have these and they can be monitored. Thank you very much. I will stop over here because of time. All right, next up on the uh, agenda, Dr. Pena is going to come talk to us about when to use ultrasound, CTA, and MRA before going to the cath lab. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My disclosures. We're going to continue on with the same uh, mode here on discussing assessment. And really, when do we use ultrasound, CTA, and MRA before going to the lab? I think it's important when you look at imaging a patient with CLI, why are we doing it? You know, I would say we're assessing the amount of disease, the severity of the disease. Is there arterial insufficiency? What's the extent of that disease? And try to make a decision whether the arterial flow is sufficient or whether we need to revascularize. And I think that's important because at that point, if you make that decision, then you may proceed with this advanced imaging to help you plan that intervention, let, let you know where the anatomic levels of diseases are, and then get more information to help with your treatment. I think we've already heard a lot about the importance of that initial assessment, physical examination, ABI, TBI, arterial PVR and segmental pressures. Really, all that kind of goes into that initial idea assessment to, all right, is there some type of vascular insufficiency? Is it in the equation for that wound? And once we make a decision that that patient requires revascularization, then that's when I think an MRA or CTA is helpful. We've already seen this graph several times, this, this algorithm of you know, what to do in, in testing. And I think it's important same kind of, at the end of the day, it really says that down here, that once you make that decision that the patient needs revascularization, then you're going to proceed with that duplex ultrasound, CT, MR, and hopefully not need a diagnostic angiogram, but sometimes you do. So what's the role of duplex ultrasound? We've already pretty much seen how it may supplement a, a PVR segmental pressures. It helps us assess flow by waveform and velocity analysis, but also gives us an idea, is there iliac disease? by that waveform in that common femoral artery. What does the common femoral artery look like? It really helps us, and I start planning, when we see disease, how we're going to approach that revascularization. And really, the duplex map, really a, almost a drawing, is really helpful. When do we get a CTA or MRA of these patients? And I think, to me, it's when we're gonna think about treatment plan. Really give me a direct morphologic evaluation of what's going on so I can decide what's my site of access. Does the patient need surgery or bypass, or is this an endovascular approach for this candidate, for this patient? What are my runoff vessels? What's really the goal of my therapy? What am I going to tell my patients in terms of risk? Do I have all the tools that I need to approach this particular patient at the time that I'm going to treat it? And what I really hope is that's going to reduce my procedure time, my contrast use, and my complication rate. Why CTA? I think CTA is very helpful in that it's isotropic imaging. By that, mean, by, by, by that means is that these images, these, these um, images, in any way we look at it on a workstation, it keeps its actual information. So we're able to look at curved planar uh, 
reformats through the vessel. We're able to perform volume rendered images. We're able to do a lot more. We're able to look at the wall, calcium, soft plaque, as well as the vessel or the lumen. So I think this is really important. There's a study that looked at patients with CTA. Most of these studies, are, however, are done on claudicants. So it's kind of a skewed population. But it looked at 212 symptomatic patients. It allowed basically a differential, you know, able to distinguish which patients should go to endovascular therapy, which patients needed surgical therapy, and which patients needed a hybrid approach. Here's an example of a patient who's had a distal bypass to the distal, um, uh, distal popliteal artery. You can see here a CTA evaluation of it. You can see that jump graft. This is what it looked at in geography. So again, it gives us a morphology and assessment of what that vessel is going to look like before we're there. Here's another patient with severe claudication. You can see these are basic rocks in the common femoral artery. Don't really want to approach this from an endovascular approach. Here's another patient with a complex left iliac lesion and also a occluded femoral artery on the left leg. Being able to look at these images and say, you know, I'm going to approach this from the right side, come up, up and over, stay away from the left groin and see if that's sufficient to help this patient with a left foot ulcer. You can see that treatment. When you're looking at the small vessels, again, patient with minimal calcification, but you can see a good opacification of the distal tibial, uh, tibial perineal trunk, being able to then say, okay, we're going to treat that tibial perineal trunk and then it's assessment after we treated it. But there's limitations when we look at uh, CTA for CLI. And that's because a lot of our patients have renal insufficiency. They can't afford the adenated contrast material. And when we assess the infrapopliteal vessels, we need to distinguish between calcium and contrast, or the vasculature. And sometimes it's very difficult in these very small two millimeter vessels. And you can tell patients with CLI have a lot of distal disease and occlusions. So this is really where I think MRA is a study of choice. It provides a great assessment of the otoiliac and femoral vessels, but along with time-resolved imaging, allows you to really get an assessment of what those infrapopliteal vessels look like. Unfortunately, it uses gadolinium. So patients with re any renal insufficiency aren't candidates. It doesn't really tell me about calcium. It has artifacts in terms of with stents and uh, metal artifacts. However, it's not always also as as reproducible and available as CTA. So that's why we kind of go towards CTA, because it's just those real obstacles that we need to eliminate for MRI studies. By time-resolved imaging, this is what I'm speaking about. These are images that basically it's 4D imaging, volumes of information being acquired every two to three seconds, so I can really get an idea how does that flow down those tibial vessels. And this is really, to me, the most important part of performing a really good quality MRA in these particular patients. So you can see here, one of these time-resolved uh, examinations, be able to slow it down. You see where the lesion is, and that's what we found in times of angiography. Again, we were ready to, uh, to prepare. We were prepared to treat that patient because we kind of knew what we we're going to expect. Again, tibial pedal evaluation, you can see here, because it's a volume of information, you can then look at it from a coronal sagittal reconstruction, as you can see here. You can see that DP occlusion, and you can plan on treat treating that appropriately. Again, this would be a patient where the ABI would be normal, and then you're looking at the abnormal TBI. And really, so we talk about hybrid imaging. So when do I consider CTA versus MRA? Really, MRA, if I have a, um, a GFR, estimated GFR over 30, uh, patients that have ionated contrast allergy, but really I'm looking for my older patients with CLI. These are patients that are calcified vessels, patients that have cardiac disease, because I'm going to be able to look at those small vessels below the knee. CTA, I reserve really for evaluations of inflow lesions, patients that may have stents or pacemakers or contraindications to MRAs. So these are the patients that I go with CTA, particularly if they're, they have contra, uh, they're able to tolerate the contrast. Dialysis patients can't get an MRA, but they can get a CTA. What's coming down the pike is non-contrast sequences. So you can see here non-contrast evaluation of the renal arteries, non-contrast evaluation both at the infrapopliteal segments. These are great imaging studies. This is where we need to go because of the issues with gadolinium. However, they look great in normal patients. They just were not there when it comes to patients with disease. A recent study published in Jack, again, looking at KISS sequences, a different type of sequence, really motion, it helps eliminate motion problems, and then being able to assess these. I think this is where we need to go with this type of work, looking at patients with CLI. This study was really mostly done, again, in claudicans. So why CT or MRA for a CLI? There's less risk to the patient than a diagnostic angiogram, less radiation to me as the performer of the angiogram, 
easier to order, cheaper than an angiogram, and I can manipulate that data. I can take all the time I need to really make my plan before I go into the uh, cath lab. The present status is that we just, we have a benefit of CTA and MRA, but we're just not well documented. In this sense of this world where we need to really know what is cost effective, we really don't know how effective these pre-procedure MRAs or CTAs are. Vari the variability at a local level is quite high. You don't know if your test is available at certain hospitals. You don't know what, what kind of test you're going to get. And there's also the patient factors that are involved. And then how are these results being utilized? And when are we ordering them? When's the right time? And I think it's when you make a decision that you're going to revascularize the patient. We really lack a universal imaging algorithm, and that's something that we need to go so we can benefit. Recent study really showed um, national vari uh, variation, and you can see that when they looked at that, not many hospitals are performing these kind of examinations, advanced imaging examinations. So I think we do need some, natural, uh, some national algorithms. So when do I choose? I think this is really a repetition. Calcified vessels, I prefer an MRA over CTA, for, uh, particularly with time resolved imaging, limited with contrast, but CTA does give me a higher spatial resolution. So with that, thank you very much for your time. Next, uh, we welcome up Dr. Uh, George Ambotek, who's going to talk to us about what is a functional amputation. Okay, I have nothing to disclose. So what is a functional amputation? I think that question is just as much a philosophical question as it is a surgical outcome question. How hard are you willing to work to prevent the major lower extremity amputation? And is it always what we should be seeking as a goal of treatment? Just as there's no national algorithm, as Dr. Pena related on CTA, MRA, there is no algorithm as to when we decide to amputate at the foot as a partial foot amputation or a below knee amputation. This can be quite variable. But when you look at functional trends globally since 2000, the trend toward reducing amputations is undeniable. 73,000 amputations were performed though in diabetics in 2010, but we know by Medicare records that amputations have decreased 37% from the years 2000 to 2010. Major lower extremity amputations well, as well as midfoot amputations have decreased, while toe amputations have raised about 6%. Yet, unfortunately, there's still a disparity in the rates of lower extremity amputation based on access to health care, gender, geography, and race. And also, I think this decision becomes more doctor-centric rather than patient-centric in many cases. And we look at this question, multiple limb salvage attempts for diabetic foot infections, is it worth it? This Singapore group aimed to study the patient's ability to return to normal life, functional status, prosthesis usage, and perspectives on multiple limb salvage procedures that culminated in a transtibular amputation. So they had 41 patients who had transtibial amputations between 2011 and 2013, and those groups were divided into the primary group. First procedure was a transtibial amputation, what they called a creeping amputation. On average, that patient had about four surgeries, mean of four surgeries. And they measured their outcomes by the Bartels Index, which measures activities of daily living, the Reintegration to Normal Living Index, which is a combination of mental, psychological, as well as physical, functional, questionnaire, and a questionnaire that identified whether the patient would undergo the same multiple attempts at limb salvage again. Overall, those two groups had similar functional levels. However, eight out of the 10 patients who were working stopped working, and only one of the 11 who was driving regained driving. Also, 51.2% actually actively used their prosthesis, but an additional four were their prosthesis just out for a social event. What's interesting is if when we look at those two groups, the primary amputation, which is numbered 24, and the creeping amputation of 17 patients, 94.1% of those patients who had anywhere from two to seven procedures would do the exact same decision-making process again. They would continue to try to do everything they could, have multiple surgeries, increase length of stay, in order to potentially save their leg. The authors concluded that from their experience, they feel that the process of attempts at limb salvage allows a patient to progress through the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, and this is a more patient-centric approach. 
So what role does function play in deciding on limb salvage versus amputation in patients with diabetes? Wukic, Rusbovic, and their group, their primary goal was to review the literature with emphasis on the functional aspects associated with successful limb salvage versus major lower extremity amputation. Their secondary goal was to review the epidemiology, quality of life, mortality, energy expenditure associated with diabetic foot disease. Their results showed that after major lower extremity amputation, which is an ankle and proximal, there was three times more likely to die within one year of surgery. The risk of death could not be associated with their comorbidities. The amputation had something in and of itself to play. Two-thirds of their diabetic patients did ambulate with the prosthesis, which is good. The preservation of function is the primary goal of treatment. Patients who have undergone successful limb salvage, however, feared major lower extremity amputation more than death, as was stated earlier. And as further, the energy cost of ambulation after a lower extremity amputation increased with more proximal amputation. And that was stated initially in 1976 and is still proven. So this is why I think partial foot amputations have a bad rap and have a bad reputation. This isn't a functional foot. How does a patient get to this place? two or three remaining toes, preulcerative lesions. It doesn't even resemble a foot anymore. Once you re resect more than a, a one ray, we have instability now to the metatarsal heads, dislocation, charco changes. And then when we take out two medial rays, we can anticipate what's going to happen, right? We're gonna get a metatarsal head three ulceration, and that's in fact what happens. We shouldn't let our patients get to this stage. There has to be a surgical plan. Our goal isn't just to heal an ulcer or eradicate infection, it's to have a functional foot a plantigrade functional foot. Truth be told, a partial foot amputation, a TMA, and a below the knee amputation are both functional. They restore the ability to wear a shoe and to walk and be ambulatory. If we look at this, this patient came to my office two weeks ago after being treated at an outside wound center for a second opinion. Why was this patient being treated for this ulcer for a whole year? It is not ulcer free, obviously, and even if you could heal this ulcer, it's not plantigrade, it's not functional. It just shouldn't be. The importance of limb preservation in the diabetic population, there's been no one probably more prolific as the Georgetown group and MedStar at looking at their partial foot amputations so that they retrospectively reviewed their partial foot amputations of which there were 92 and compared them to the 25 major lower extremity amputations that had no prior limb salvage. The goals of the study were to determine the outcomes and patient characteristics, assess risk factors in the high risk diabetic population requiring a partial foot amputation and compare those factors to the major lower extremity amputation group to help determine and criteria that warrant leg amputation in our diabetic population. At one year, 86% of the partial foot amputations healed. By the end of two years, 80% were still alive versus the 48% alive after a transtibial amputation. Of the 33 partial foot amputations that were bypassed, 99% salvage rate. Even those, however, that were non-bypassable had PAD, 47% of those wounds healed. That's a pretty significant number. In the end-stage renal disease patient, there was a 59% healing rate. Again, not so bad for an ischemic or dysvascular foot ulceration. Their statement was that complete charcoal collapse of the foot and severe hind foot pathology were the only identifiable risk factors that existed in the transtibial amputation group and concluded that surgeons should strive to preserve as much of the lower extremity as possible to preserve function. If we look at this and get more specific on procedures though, I didn't want to be remiss and leave this study out because it kind of goes against what was just said. If we look at a partial first ray amputation, this, the Spanish group looked at their ulcer, they're actually their uh, partial first ray amputations and found that when you resect less than 25% of that first metatarsal, ulcer recurrence was significantly higher. So I think this is interesting and probably can be translated out even to our TMA patients. Preserving the length of the metatarsal may not be so important. And I looked at my own patient population and looked at Steve here, who's been about 10 years out or more after partial first ray amputations. And, we, and for me, it's, it holds true. He keeps breaking down metatarsal head one. He's not the most adherent to his footwear and I see him regularly and this has been the one site that has continued to break down. There are many functional amputation levels, especially distally. A partial fifth ray amputation, I'll see patients for the last 15 to 20 years who have never had another ulcer or amputation after a partial fifth ray amputation, very functional. A central ray uh, resection, if it's one and it heals, which is often in that dysvascular foot, 
We can get that to heal. Often they do well. Digital amputations, of course, hallux amputations, of course. Now you may see there's other digital deformities that can form around them, but those are treatable. Arthroplasty, tenotomy, and adherence to prescription footwear. Of course, one of our favorites is the distal cymes, easy to do, and probably a 99.9% .9 success rate for osteomyelitis, chronic ulcerations, and infection can be done in the clinic or, e or the hospital or ambulatory setting. I didn't want to be remiss here either because rehabilitation is probably something that I have underlooked for a number of years. But in this VA study, they took patients who had major lower extremity amputation anywhere from immediate post-op to two years post-op and found that they were 17% more likely to achieve mobility success with intensive rehabilitation. Now, I'm not at a VA, so I can't do an inpatient rehabilitation, but I think there's some truth to be said that every time we see the patients, I'm evaluating footwear, we should be evaluating their functional status level too and try to work to improve it. What they also found was that younger patients were more, more mobile. Again, this is a VA group, but I think this has something to be told here too, because when we look at our patient population who are now aged, this is an, a lady who had been offered an above knee amputation at an outside hospital. Of course, came for a second opinion, saw Mady and you know, critical limb ischemia, 89 years old, but really relatively in good health. She had bilateral hallux amputations. So in this setting, next day had intervention, percutaneous transluminal angioplasty of the TP trunk distally to the distal perineal artery at the ankle successfully. Four to five days later, we do the transmetatarsal amputation with good adequate blood flow and about two months later, completely healed. I continue to see her two and a half years later. She walks with a walker, lives at home with her daughter, and goes gambling all the time. A very functional life, and she's happy. Much better than, I think, the alternative. If you're going to live out your next last few years, do you want to have good quality of life? Why would we discriminate on age? This 70-year-old Hispanic male presented again to an outside hospital, and they told him that his toe should auto-amputate and send him home. So he comes to clinic about one week later after the holidays. I see him about January 8th with a TBI of 0.18. I was not so convinced that this was going to auto-amputate, so I consulted our vascular colleague who did perform angioplasty of the anterior tibial artery. Now, I have a little caveat here. This is really the right second toe. This is not him because I couldn't find a patient from his picture from January 8th, but it would look very much like this, only the right foot. So he had two hospitalizations, one at the outside hospital for about two days for IV antibiotics and a vascular surgery consult. Then we readmit him to our hospital. And after intervention, I amputate a second and third toes, send him home, comes back, and we can see now, not so good, kind of ominous now, Dis dysvascular fourth toe and hallux. So he comes in for a third hospitalization, a second angioplasty, and then we perform the transmetatarsal amputation. With still some questionable bleeding, but hope that we're going to succeed because this is such a nice guy and his daughter is beautiful. So he comes in in February and it's kind of soupy. We're not giving up on this. We're taking deep cultures. He's getting antibiotics at dialysis. In March now, it's looking a little necrotic. Still, though, not really ready to throw in the towel. We're just about four to six weeks post-op, eight weeks post-op. And we continue to do once daily, maybe twice daily dressing changes. See him every week, at least every other week in April. We're still not so good after that early February surgery. He should have been healed by now, but we're continuing good wound care. Conscientious, now in April, we're kind of, we're, we're on third base, we're heading home. And in, in fact, he healed quite well at that point with some mechanical negative pressure wound therapy. And here he is today, very, very happy. And so are we for the slim salvage case. But we, were, we would know that if this patient did have a transtibial amputation, which could have very well likely happened um, under different surgical care and different people, he still had probably a good chance of improving his quality of life. Wukic studied there 41 patients who had transtibial amputations, and the key factor was the ability to successfully ambulate, put on a prosthesis, and ambulate. And that, after one year, had equivalent functional, good functional quality of life. So there are naysayers and those who question what we're all here for, and that's preservation and trying to prevent amputation. Dylan is an engineer out of Australia, and he's been reporting on this topic for about 10 years. So this is the most recent article. And he looked at the literature from 2000 to 2015. And after looking at the literature on the dysvascular amputations of partial foot versus below the knee, he said, aside from mortality, which I think is a big one, by the way, there was limited evidence regarding outcomes of dysvascular partial foot amputations, particularly how outcomes differ between levels of partial foot amputation and transtibial amputation. Available evidence suggests that a large proportion of people with partial foot amputations experience delayed wound healing and ipsilateral re-amputation. People with transtibial amputations increased risk of mortality compared to those with partial foot amputations. 
Mobility and quality of life may be similar, however, in people with partial foot amputations and transtibular amputations. So there is a professional bias here, and we all have to take our, our stance. What will, how will you view your dysvascular foot? How far will you go to try to prevent that major lower extremity amputations? In conclusion, limb salvage is time consuming, multiple hospitalizations, multiple surgeries, inpatient, outpatient work. But an ulcer-free plantigrade functional foot is the goal of limb salvage. Live by the hypothesis preserve length, but not to the expense of a functional foot. End stage renal disease, PAD, CAD, and advanced age are not absolute indications for major lower extremity amputations. The indications for a major lower extremity amputation should be a contralateral major amputation in a non-ambulatory patient, unreconstructable hind foot, charco foot deformities, inability to achieve an infection-free, ulcer-free plantar grade foot, and of course, life-threatening infections. Thank you. All right, next, uh, Dr. Kalluri is gonna talk to us about mixed venous and arterial ulcers and how he approaches these. Thank you, Derry. Uh, back, maybe? Okay. So these are my disclosures. Uh, I guess all these companies do something or the other with, with uh, critical limb ischemia, so I will keep it that way, uh, but not specifically anything related to the topic I'm talking about. Mixed venous and arterial ulcers and how I take care of them. Um, I think this is an important topic. Dr. Meyer uh, um, um, addressed this. Uh, and during the talk, I'm going to phone a friend. These two people taught me quite a bit uh, almost a decade and a half ago now when I was uh, training in Cleveland Clinic. So I'll ask, uh, I'll ask them a few questions like phone a friend. So the garden variety venous ulcers that we're taught about, if we are taught about, uh, is that painless um, ulceration along the medial malleolus. Uh, uh, this is uh, so, someone uh, who had uh, uh, a moiodin uh, a filter that you know, occluded and eventually ended up with post-thrombotic syndrome like this. But this is the classic gator area with lipidermatosclerosis, hemosiderin, generally painless and, you know, maybe uh, diffusely uh, 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 hyperpigmented as well. But there are painful venous ulcers without any underlying peripheral artery disease. And this is important because I've seen in my practice where that focal anterior tibial stenosis was uh, uh, angioplasty because they came in with these ulcers that are uh, painful. Uh, these are called the atrophy blanche ulcers, which are um, the very superficial atrophied areas with blanching of the skin, which is pale discoloration in the middle of the hyperpigmented area with these punctate areas of uh, hyperpigmentation, which is called the atrophy blanche. So these are painful venous ulcerations in the interest of time. I'm not going to go into the much details, but know that there are painful venous ulcerations, and some of these venous ulcerations are a lot more painful than critical limb ischemia ulcerations. Um, there could be also lividoid vasculopathy underlying, uh, combined with venous insufficiency and lipidermatosclerosis, which is a form of vasculitis, small vessel vasculitis, that may need disease-modifying agents and corticosteroids and that kind of treatment, too. So it's very important, again, to think about all of those things and not just go after um, uh, a, uh, an angioplasty or, uh, or a reperfusion, uh, as uh, Terry uh, alluded to. You have seen my uh, disclosures. I'm uh, blamed to be an interventionalist, although I'm not an in, not, not a interventionalist because uh, I am very aggressive in getting the patients the entire care, including intervention, but not when it's inappropriate, uh, that bothers me. So when you see these type of patients uh, and you see just focal stenosis, focal occlusion in one of the tibial vessels, that's not it. I've seen this in social media all the time. Um, so here is an example of a, a garden variety combined arterial venous ulceration, which is here is a 72-year-old usual uh, PAD risk factors and comes in, has a history of long SFA stent from the groin to the popliteal area that is now occluded on duplex, and he comes 
into the clinic um, with uh, a painful ulceration and also noted to have some reflux in the GSV reflux. And I'm putting the maximum diameter as 0.8 centimeters because I might want to use it as a, 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 as a bypass uh, for my vascular surgeon. Uh, and the vascular surgeon needs to know that if the stent is reoccluded. So this was earlier on in my career, and uh, uh, this is how the, uh, how the ulcer looked when, the, when I saw the patient for my senior partner who was lecturing in Japan that week, and the patient refused to be seen or stented or revascularized by anyone else, and he wanted to come next week when uh, my senior partner returned from Japan, and this is how it looked. So within one week, so this is how bad these ulcerations can get. So just remember that they can be very, very, very aggressive. Um, so why is it so important? Because you have, for venous ulcers and edema, you need to have that compression, Dr. Meyer talked about, and then that needs to be balanced with the skin uh, perfusion and ischemia. Um, so let's talk, let's go back backwards and see, um, you know, what the natural history and what the prevalence is. The arterial and venous disease coexistence is thought to be up to 20% of all the lower extremity ulcerations from an old study in 1991. And where did this, you know, you all probably have heard of, you know, not applying compression therapy if the ABI is less than 0.8. Well, you know, I had to dig around, and the first uh, paper that actually set this tone for 0.8 ABI is actually a nursing study that was published in 1986, where they looked at all the wound, uh, um, uh, lower extremity wounds, and they noted that 22% of the mixed arterial venous ulcers with ABI uh, that were non-healing had an ABI of 0.62. So they recommended that an ABI of 0.7 and five uh, as a cutoff, which would decrease the healing dramatically. So since then on, this 0.8 got caught on. The uh, Gloucestershire group, which has uh, done the Evra trial, the, um, the Eschgar trial, and all these wound trials in arterial and venous disease, published a paper a few years after that. And what they did is they basically took a small group of patients with ABI of less than 0.5 and ABI of greater than 0.85. And if they had point greater than 0.85, they did modified compression. If they failed compression, and they went on to the angiography group. And in the severe arterial group, they went on straight to the angiography group. They divided these groups, uh, the, the, the total number of patients, into three groups, ABI of greater than 0.85, ABI greater than, uh, less than 0.85, and then ABI of less than 0.5. As you can see, at uh, 36 weeks, the group three, which is you know uh, the uh, ABI less than 0.5, almost at 24 months, uh, at 24 weeks, you can see almost 100% of these ulcers were unhealed, were non-healed, and about 20% were not healed even at the 48 uh, mark. And you can see that at 48 week. Group two and group one, meaning ABIs of greater than 0.85 and 0.8, um, were quite similar. So what are the other risk factors that um, uh, affect the healing in uh, arterial and uh, venous ulcerations? This is the Peter Schneider uh, and Treman group. Uh, they looked at several patients. Their key uh, point here was whether the graft, the surgical graft, was patent or occluded. And if there was a DVT in those patients' history or not. When they looked at uh, those two factors and they treated the patients who had uh, normal patent graft with bypass surgery and uh, with safina additional bypass surgery and saphenous stripping, um, they noted significant improvement in their wound care, 68% healed and 78% healed, while patients who had arterial graft occlusion no one healed, and patients with history of DVT also did not heal uh, significantly compared to the other group. Um, so they came up with a conclusion that if you have an arterial graft occlusion or a history of DVT, your, your venous ulcers are probably not going to heal. Okay, the more contemporary in 2007, the same group again, Poskett, you know, from uh, the Gloucestershire group, 
they did a six-year follow-up study in UK, and here they looked at ABIs greater than 0.85, ABIs less than 0.5, and somewhere in between. What they did is 0.85, they treated with multi-layered compression wraps, um, and anyone who had less than 0.5 the severe PAD group in that uh, paper underwent immediate revascularization, and anyone with moderate PAD basically uh, had uh, conservative treatment and then followed by revascularization if not healed. So what did they find? They found um, that um, the PAD, severe PAD patients had 53% healing at 36 weeks compared to moderate PAD that were treated with modified compression therapy and intervention only if needed, and patients who had no peripheral disease, again, were treated with just compression therapy. Again, severe PAD. So the most important part of this paper, in my mind, was the 30-day mortality was 6.5%. Uh, so these patients with combined arterial venous disease are probably a lot more sicker than just the CLI patients, too. So that's another important thing to remember. So what about other options in these patients other than just revascularization? The arterial flow device, I'm sure uh, several of you have heard about this. Again, um, uh, this has a specific type of pneumatic compression, uh, distal and proximal in sequence, and it basically increases the nitric oxide also at the microvascular level without going into uh, significant details. Small studies, unfortunately, are published, and um, there are no large studies on uh, pneumatic compression devices. Uh, they're not covered by insurance. Generally, it takes a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, um, phone call to get these approved, but what it, in these small studies have shown is that the uh, pneumatic compression uh, devices improve claudication distance, improve wound healing, decreases amputation, um, could be used in no-option patients and could be used as an adjunct as well. Pentoxifilin also has been um, uh, uh, known to improve wound healing, whether compared to placebo or compression. So I routinely use uh, pentoxifilin uh, in my severe uh, uh, non-healing or recalcitrant venous ulcers. What, what about you all? Do you use pentoxifilin too? Cool. Yes. So, so this is my algorithm, this is what I do. If it's a mixed etiology, I start with the ABI duplex and the venous reflux test. Now ABIs, I should say PVRs, if the ABIs slash PVRs look normal, then they go through the two-layered to four-layered compression wraps depending on how, the, how much the seepage is. Go with the wound care, skin grafts, artificial if you need, be, need to, and then do thermal ablation or foam ablation or phlebectomy depending on what is needed for that particular vein. Once the ulcer is healed, the ulcers need to be prevented by graduated compression socks and potentially uh, with pentoxifelin. Now if it's severe PAD, go straight to the revascularization and if no option, then you do the same things that you did here, uh, plus arterial flow device or vein pump or lymphedema pump, close monitoring. If it's moderate PAD with, P, with, P, with uh, ABIs and PVRs, I gently apply compression wraps. I don't know what the panel does, and I'd like to get your input and also educate the family that if it starts hurting, cut it off take it off, and then see them very frequently every week, make sure that they're improving, and also get them revascularized if it's not going as planned or if they don't have an option. Once revascularized, again, they go into moderate PAD group or normal ABI group and then follow the algorithm that way. So final pearls, be aggressive with revascularization when needed, uh, when you know that it is what it's causing. Spare the saphenous vein. Now, this is another uh, thing the vascular surgeons in the audience will agree with me that there will not be a bypass with the number of vein ablations that are done. Um, and in, in my practice, I take a very careful history, even in, even in patients who don't have CLI, if they have significant PAD, I will try my best to spare that saphenous vein because as long as it's a certain diameter, uh, 0.8 centimeter, 0.8 centimeters or 0.7 centimeters, it could still be a good graft even if it's refluxing. Uh, 
think outside the box. Uh, there are multiple compression methods. You could modify compression. Here is a tuba grip with a strap that resulted in healing of a combined ulceration. Do least harm because these are very fragile patients. Collaborate if you're not comfortable. Uh, we saw, um, you know, our podiatry uh, colleagues who we we always collaborate, and I learn so much from them. And also, finally, you know, it's not always about look how great my angiogram looks on social media for who you who are on social media. Please share your suboptimal results too, because it's not just that angioplasty that takes care of the wounds. Uh, with that, I'll end. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shook has volunteered to uh, either go at the end or even move his talk to tomorrow since we are so far behind. So with that, is Dr. Prasad here? All right, we're going to invite Dr. Prasad to come uh, to the podium. He's going to discuss with us the must-read articles for CLI. All right, thank you. I'll try to get moving so that we can catch up here. my disclosures. So some of this will be a continuation of what Dr. Niazi talked about in terms of hemodynamics. And so from an editor's viewpoint, I'm the associate editor for CCI, so uh, I picked a few articles, not just CCI articles, that I think uh, we all need to be familiar with. I want to start with a quick case, 54-year-old female, diabetes presents with a focal right third toe plantar ulceration. She undergoes ABI assessment by an outside physician, but at that time has no referral for further invasive therapy for about three months, has some local debridement, osteomyelitis develops. And if you look at her ABIs, what do you notice? That they look pretty normal. Does the patient actually have significant PAD? And as we've seen, you know, we have to look further, and the digital uh, uh, toe brachial indices are, are abnormal. So when we actually do an angiogram, she really has no inflow or tibial disease and has a diseased uh, pedal plantar loop, as you can see, diffuse disease, undergoes successful angioplasty, and then is able to heal her amputation. And so what this really points to is the fact that the ABI is a very crude test, and particularly in critical limb ischemia, we have to be careful with it. So our goals in revascularization are really angiographic uh, improvement in the lab, where we want to improve blood flow ideally to the angiosome in question, or if you can, globally to the entire foot, and then have some degree of durability, at least long enough so that we can get proper wound care and have the ulcer heal. Of these, number one is really the key for uh, endovascular operators, because we, we don't want them to leave the lab with a suboptimal hemodynamic result. So hemodynamic assessments involve baseline assessment, post-procedure, and serial longitudinal time points to be able to follow these patients over uh, their clinic visits. A wide variety of different tests, you've heard a lot about these different ones, ABI, toe brachial, duplex, transcutaneous oximetry, various forms of non-invasive angiography, and then you know, sort of the good old physical exam, which has uh, obvious limitations. There's quite a few deficiencies in the literature uh, in that uh, most of the guidelines recommend the use of ABIs and ankle pressures in patients with PAD, and these data are largely derived from claudicants. And so the utility of these measures in critical limb ischemia is still very poorly understood. Uh, in claudicants, you saw earlier a change of about 0.15 has been associated with improved outcomes, uh, but whether that applies to CLI or not is, is still uncertain. And the derivation of the toe brachial index, we hold gospel that 0.7 is some kind of magical number. But if you go back and survey the literature and understand where that 0.7 came from, you'll see that it's not really derived from a CLI population. So here are the four articles that I felt were most relevant from uh, 2017 to 2018 in the context of hemodynamic assessment. One's out of the Michigan University of Michigan group, two are from Mehdi Sishabor's group, uh, and one is in fact uh, uh, in collaboration with my fellow Tarek, who's, who's here. And uh, one is a interesting proof of concept study out of Hungary that we'll briefly touch upon. So the first study is from Michael Grossman's group at uh, in Ann Arbor, 10,000 patients undergoing endovascular or surgical revascularization. They surveyed the Blue Cross Blue Shield Registry in Michigan, and their goal was basically very simple, to describe the distribution of ABIs in a CLI population. 
And what you see here is the distribution of uh, ABIs uh, by patients undergoing uh, PVI, which I highlighted in uh, blue, and surgery, which is the lighter line, and patients undergoing peripheral vascular interventions at higher ABIs than surgical, but that's not the relevant point. It's more that you see a bell-shaped distribution of ABIs across the CLI population. So it's not necessarily skewed towards low ABIs. When you actually break it down, and so when you look at categories of normal ABI, mild to moderate or severe, you see that uh, normal ABIs uh, are about 20 to 25 percent, mild to moderate 50 to 60, and severe 14 to 20. So this really tells you that the vast majority of people in this large series have normal or mildly impaired ABIs, despite having critical limb ischemia. And only 20% of patients in their cohort actually had toe brachial pressures even measured. So uh, one, at least one interesting finding was regardless of the ABI, revascularization improved quality of life and function. So there is a, this disconnect between these indices and the response to revascularization. So once we uh, have assessed them at baseline, we want to be able to follow these patients longitudinally. So how do we assess hemodynamics post-revascularization? And that's what uh, Dr. Shishabor's group looked at. Uh, they had an observational study, 218 patients undergoing endovascular therapy for CLI. They looked at pre and post uh, indices and examined this in the context of wound healing and major adverse limb events. Uh, again, you see a distribution of ABI in the population uh, and after revascularization, an increase in ABI. Similarly, in TBI, it improves after revascularization therapy. We saw these data earlier, uh, so I won't spend too much time on it, but understanding that they found an ABI increase of 0.23 was associated with improved wound healing and a TBI increase of 0.21 was associated with increased probability of wound healing. So again, as we heard, small sample size, but still uh, important signal that our traditional definitions of 0.15 in Claudicans may not apply to CLI. So uh, when we uh, further look at this, this is uh, uh, Mehdi and uh, Dr. Hamad's uh, work of looking at the Impact Deep uh, trial, and they looked at uh, 358 patients from this study, and they looked at ankle and toe pressures, so as opposed to just ABIs looking at absolute ankle and toe pressures, and the response uh, to endovascular therapy in the change in these measures, and the association with outcomes. And when they used receiver operating curves uh, with male or major adverse limb events as an endpoint, they found a cutoff of a change of 73 or a change of one millimeter for toe pressure to be significant. The AUCs are relatively modest, 0.51 and 0.64, and that's reflected in the male-free survival where if you had an improvement of more than 73 millimeters of mercury in your ankle pressure, there was some thought or some trend that there was a benefit but did not reach statistical significance. However, with toe, toe uh, pressures, if you increased it by one, there was a benefit with respect to probability of healing. So what this tells us is absolute uh, changes are small in toe pressures, but they may be relevant, and perhaps absolute ankle pressures alone are less helpful. So maybe taking it in account with a ABI change or TBI change is more helpful. So uh, finally, when you are in the lab itself and we're trying to make treatment decisions, as opposed to the coronary circulation where we can do a variety of different techniques to understand whether we've treated a lesion successfully, we're limited. So uh, in this study out of Hungary, they considered the use of invasive measurements using principles of pressure gradients and FFR to help predict outcomes in patients with CLI. Again, very small study, but I think important to understand as a proof of concept. About 39 patients, they looked at resting gradients, FFR measurements, correlated those with non-invasive parameters. They used a pressure wire. They used hyperemia with papaverin, 40 milligrams injected into the artery and had uh, clinical angiographic follow-up. An example from their report is here. Here's the uh, anterior tibial artery, and you can see diffuse disease before a uh, FFR of 0.66, and after therapy, that increases to 0.83. I'll note, I want you to note here, look at their perineal artery, which has been untouched, which is still diseased, and we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. When they correlated these invasive hemodynamic measurements with uh, transcutaneous oximetry, toe pressures, and perfusion indices, the correlations were relatively weak. However, baseline FFR had the strongest correlation 
with baseline measures of perfusion, including toe pressure. Uh, so here's the response in gradients before and after angioplasty. You can see they demonstrated a decline in uh, pressure gradient, a improvement in the translesional resting ratio, and improvement in FFR. But the gradients in FFR improved but did not normalize post-intervention. And I think part of this is also the fact that if you don't uh, assess the distal vascular bed, that's going to be a problem. Uh, completeness, completeness of revascularization is important as well, which uh, was not entertained in this study. When they looked at the correlations and uh, with respect to major adverse ev events, the FFR value of more than 0.66 had the best cutoff value to prevent freedom from MACE. And they also measured something called an FFR wedge pressure, where they actually inflated a balloon on the FFR wire and got a distal wedge pressure, which has relevance in the, in the context of collaterals. They found that people who had a lower wedge pressure underwent more amputations, very small sample size. But again, this is a very important first study in this context. So take home points, the ideal non-invasive measurement uh, in CLI is still unclear. It appears that changes in measurements are more helpful than absolute static measures, and that uh, these changes uh, you know, can be looked at uh, in terms of associations with improvements in symptoms, uh, but that's still relatively new ground for CLI. And I think there is a role for FFR in invasive hemodynamics, but that's still uncertain. Thank you. All right, Dr. Kimmel is going to come and talk to us uh, now about how to manage the non-healing uh, amputation stumps. Okay, I want to thank the committee and Dr. Shishpur for uh, inviting me here. Um, I actually try to do my best to keep it in eight minutes, so I might move a little fast, um, might be a little bit basic, but I'm going to show a couple examples. So this patient uh, actually is a 38-year-old male who is a heroin user, and he injected between his uh, first and second toe and basically caused a amount of severe vasoconstriction. So he was sent to an outside hospital, another hospital in the city, then I just got consulted on this patient. We went ahead and did a TMA. We let it demarcate to some degree. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, a lot of this with the heroin, whatever else was in there, um, causes a significant amount of micro damage to the vessels. So this is what we're kind of left with to kind of see what we could do at this point. You know, next is that this was a patient, a 65-year-old male. Uh, he presented had end-stage renal disease, uh, had osteomyelitis, and went ahead and did a, uh, a TMA on this patient. Obviously, his wound dehissed with that, but we want to get a patient from a wound that looks like this to completely healed like that. So what are the steps that we're going to do? And a lot of this is a review of what everybody else has said, so it's really good build up for everything. So I kind of looked initially at TMAs, even though it was a general statement for amputations, but this is listed in the order of predictive healing with the worst uh, being at first. So obviously patients that have uh, any type of amputations due to vascular disease or vascular status uh, have a very low risk of healing. Uh, infection comes after that, and then traumatic amputation. But if you look in the literature, uh, what they're recommending, what they're stating is that roughly only about 50% of the patients that have TMAs do heal. So we're kind of flipping the coin with these patients. This is an old study, I know Dr. Botek had uh, mentioned it. Um, this is from JBJS in 1976. But what they did was take a look at the energy cost of amputees. And the reason uh, that I included in this is, is sort of what Dr. Botek said about the functional amputation. But if you just take a look, and, and this is a 40-year-old paper, but if you look at the amount of oxygen uptake uh, at the vascular amputees, starting with the syme and going up to the above knee, you could sort of see that the oxygen uptake is significantly less with a more distal amputation. So that is obviously what we're trying to do is keep these patients a little bit healthier, for lack of a better description, uh, so that it's less effect on their heart and their lungs. So what do we do? What are the basics? And this is just basic wound care, what I like to follow. Um, it was wonderful to run into a couple of my former residents here. Uh, but this is one of the, some of the things that I, that I always stress. So obviously, sometimes we are, we're doing these amputations, uh, patient comes in with gas gangrene. You know, sometimes we're behind the eight ball. We can't have a full vascular workup. So obviously we check the pulses. You know, the big thing is that, you know, if something is not palpable, is it operable? 
And I'm always you know, a big proponent of everybody that treats lower extremities, whether it's a wound or not, should have a Doppler in the office. It's $100 off of eBay. Even if you can't get waveforms, you can at least listen to uh, the sound of the waveforms with that. Obviously, you know, sometimes we have patients that the graph went down. Uh, so we need to do other tests to see and obviously get them into uh, a vascular specialist you know, for possible intervention with that. What about imaging? Um, I, I think Dr. Botek, Dr. Myers both talked about serial x-rays. I think that's really important. Once this patient has a dehiscence, I send them immediately for an x-ray and then I'll have them come back on a weekly basis, but maybe every two weeks grab an x-ray. I don't think you need to run for an MRI so quickly just because of the cost with that. But if there's some questions on the radiographs, uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't get that. I don't have access to the Luna or the SPY, which are able to check the microcirculation on the angiosomes, but that's also you know, something if that's available at your facility is a great idea with that. So what is the treatment? Obviously basic wound care. And my big thing is debridement, okay? We have to be aggressive with these debridements. You know, I'm a big fan of bright lights and cold steel. You know, take a scalpel to these patients, take a curette to these patients but you have to be very, very aggressive with this debridement. Sometimes, you know, you just have to take them to the operating room. You know, that's where you're gonna get your best debridement. You can control a lot of things. I know a lot of times in the clinic, you're trying to do an aggressive debridement, the patient's on Plavix or Coumadin, or whatever they might be on, and there's a pool of blood on the floor. So sometimes it's best to get them into the operating room. Obviously, bioburden should be addressed. You could take a culture of the wound. I usually kind of hold off on any antibiotics unless they're clinically infected with that. Um, there's some companies now that are doing these uh, DNA type of cultures where they're looking at you know, what antibiotic, I'm sorry, what um, bacteria might be present in the wound. But unless it's clinically infected, I really don't think you need to treat it with that. If it's a long-standing ulcer or a long-standing um, post-op wound dehiscence, you know, take, a, um, take a biopsy. Okay, there could be something else going on. So there's definitely some other things that we need to talk about. I like to see my patients post-op, you know, especially if they have a wound dehiscence and it's not looking good, they have to come back every week. You can't wait, uh, you know, two weeks to see these patients. So, and, and obviously keeping the proper wound environment, um, you know, a moist wound environment. So whether it's daily dressing changes um, with some type of antibiotic ointment or a hydrogel or some other product, um, I think it's best to, to do it daily with that. But with our vascular patients, we're, we have to put in these other comorbidities. Um, obviously, renal disease, patients with end-stage renal disease, whether it's three or four, we know that you know, we're behind the eight ball with that. We really have to be aggressive. We can't wait on them. And like Dr. Corman said, it's a team approach. You know, call up the nephrologist and say, hey, you know, Mr. Smith's creatinine is, is 3.5. You know, we need to do something with this patient. Um, previous history of an amputation, you know, have these patients had toes or ray amputated? You know, do we go to, to a TMA or do we go to something a little bit more proximal but still keeping it distal to the ankle? Um, elevated hemoglobin A1C. I was the residency director for 10 years at the VA. I, I was happy to see a patient that had something of an A1C of under 9 that had an amputation. So obviously talking with the endocrinologist and try to get these patients a little bit more uh, glucose control is going to help with these amputations to heal. Also, too, don't forget the nutritional status. Take a look at the albumin and prealbumin. I mean, those are very important, too, that sometimes we just kind of overlook those things. So get a nutritional consult if you need to. And then finally, too, if this patient's had this post-op wound dehiscence in, um, in more than 30 days, we need to be very aggressive with these patients. So like I said, minimal improvement, we have to be aggressive. Take them to the operating room. If you're able to debride it down, with the scalpel, if you want to use the, the hydrotherapy devices or ultrasonic devices to ride these wounds. If you have a good granular wound bed, then go ahead, do a split thickness skin graft. It's the gold standard. You know, go ahead and put that on or use an allograft or a xenograft of your choice. Um, but you know, we shouldn't wait on these patients because we want to basically keep them to have a functional amputation. So what's next? Sometimes with these patients, you know, I'll go ahead, I'll divide them, I might do a skin graft with them, but I like to do adjunctive and multimodal therapy. And basically the best way I could describe it is it's kind of like making soup. You need a good stock or base, which is obviously good wound care with that, but like Emerald says, you need something to kick it up a little bit. So when you're making soup, you add different spices to it. So sometimes we need to add some other things. Obviously, um, hyperbaric therapy you know, is something to definitely be considered. But this also takes a commitment from the patient. You need to make sure that the patient's willing to do 
you know, at least 20 to you know, 25 dives in a month to get this to heal. If they're not going to commit to go every day or during the week, you know, it's worthless for that. And then obviously to negative pressure. Uh, definitely can and, and I wouldn't say should be, but it's definitely a good treatment option to be used in conjunction with that. So what about further amputations like the gentleman who uh, was the heroin uh, patient, you know? Skin coverage is very important. So the next level would be show ports. So you're leaving the, the calcaneus and the talus. But if you could barely get the skin closed, you know, I, I've done it unfortunately too many times to try to get closure. If you put too much tension on that wound, it's gonna dehiss again. So sometimes it's better to go to a little bit more proximal amputation, that's a sinus amputation. And you know, with that, there's a lot of discussion in regards to you know, how functional that is. You know, you talk to some of the orthotists, you talk to some of the vascular surgeons, you know, they say it's, it's not as functional as having a transtibular amputation. But it's definitely a decrease on the load, as we saw in that study, on the load in the heart with that. And then finally, a transtibular amputation. If you have a patient that's relatively healthy, um, they're revascularized, they're diabetic, but they're in relatively good control, you know, sometimes it's better if their TMA fails, you know, go right to the transhibitor amputation, get them fitted for a prosthetic. Usually the TMA, I'm sorry, the BKs, you know, heal a little bit faster. They could get them in a prosthetic and, and get them walking a little bit quicker with that. So that's all I have. Um, so I thank everyone for their attention. All right, next up, uh, Dr. Koshi is gonna come and uh, share with us a case. Sure thing. I know we're running a little bit behind, but so I'll try and move fast. Um, but I've got a case that sort of, uh, will try and tie in uh, some of the things that we've heard today. Um, so thanks for the invitation. Um, so it's a 53-year-old male with a past medical history of hypertension, poorly controlled diabetes, came into the ER uh, with a right foot wound. Um, he said that initially it started as a blister, but sort of had been slowly progressing for the last two to three months. Um, a week prior to coming into the hospital, started to develop some uh, purulent drainage. Um, at home, it tried some over-the-counter creams, he had said, but no relief and sort of uh, no healing of the wound. So on admission, uh, he was a febrile heart rate, he was 95, blood pressure, uh, he was hypertensive. Uh, his labs were notable uh, for a white count of 15. His set rate was 103. CRP was 10.5. Um, and this is a picture of the wound uh, when he initially presented. Uh, so it was on the right lateral heel, uh, four by two by 0.5 centimeters. Um, pulses weren't palpable. Um, and as a result of the wound, sort of the inflammatory markers that were higher, he was admitted to the medicine service. Um, was initially started on broad spectrum antibiotics due to some concern for uh, infection, obviously. Um, and then podiatry was consulted. Um, he underwent an IND that uh, following day um, and underwent uh, bone resection of the calcaneus. The intraoperative findings were that there was pus with necro necrotic fat, uh, muscle and fascia on the lateral side of the foot. Uh, the periosteum was necrotic with soft bone um, and it was noted to have poor bleeding. And at that time they had planned for further resection of the calcaneus. So this is a picture sort of uh, immediately post-op from him. Um, as is sort of the routine sort of uh, with most of the pe people that come into this service, um, they underwent sort of a non-invasive vascular evaluation given he had non-palpable pulses and sort of the poor bleeding uh, at the wound. Um, his right lower extremity ABI was 0.69 and his PVRs were suggestive of uh, distal SFA and popliteal disease. Uh, his toe pressure uh, was 58 millimeters of mercury and his TBI was 0.38. So some evidence of uh, vascular disease as well. So. Uh, in the course of his hospitalizations, his uh, deep wound cultures returned positive for MSSA and enterococcus, um, and his path from the initial bone resection uh, was consistent with acute osteomyelitis. Um, as a sort of a result of those findings, he went back to the OR on the post, uh, sort of post-operative day five of his hospitalization, um, was found to have sort of extensive necrosis of the muscle. Uh, the first and second layer uh, of the muscles were excised, um, and he also had a partial uh, calcaneectomy. Um, and sort of uh, post-op day five here, you can see uh, sort of post-op from this procedure, um, and then also follows sort of post-op day seven, um, sort of still poor bleeding uh, in the entire wound. Cultures at that time um, and deep cultures uh, still remain positive for MSSA and enterococcus. Um, and sort of during his hospitalization, uh, ID was consulted. Uh, they recommended uh, six weeks of antibiotics uh, or further sort of uh, amputation. So a Y45 score was calculated for him, was found to be 313. Issue is it's not really applicable in this situation, I think, um, just given the fact that he has, still has ongoing infection in this situation. So um, at this time, uh, given the large soft tissue defect, um, and it was felt that this wound was not going to heal, 
um, he was referred for a possible BKA. Um, and prior to that BKA, the surgeons had requested uh, peripheral angiography. So his iliac angiography uh, reveals a severe uh, stenosis of the right common iliac. Uh, the, uh, from common femoral, common femoral looked okay. Uh, I can play one more, it should be playing on its own. You can see that iliac stenosis right there. Um, significantly also, he seems to have uh, almost a subtotal occlusion of the SFA, uh, the right SFA here. Uh, further distally, he also has severe stenosis uh, further down. And below the knee, his AT uh, looked good, good flow. The perineal also looked uh, okay. The PT was noted to be occluded. Uh, it started moving his foot in some of the pictures, so I just took some plain films. Um, but just so you know, is he does have to the foot a uh, single vessel, um, but has a multi-level occlusion of the perineal. Um, as well as the distal portion of the PT. PT was filling uh, retrograde by some AT collaterals. So uh, as a result of this, and the plan was uh, initially for a BKA, um, and given his severe inflow disease, we decided to go ahead and treat his SFA. Um, plan was an integrated approach, used a glide wire advantage, and a quick cross support catheter, was initially dilated with a 60 by 100 angiosculpt um, with, some, uh, with a good result. Uh, Post-balloon angioplasty, um, has a very minimal, um, some, some very non-flow limiting dissections, but overall uh, a good result. And as a result of that, we thought that we could get away with uh, going ahead and treating this with uh, DEB. So we used a 60 by 120 Stellar X uh, and also a 60 by 80 proximally. Post-procedure um, had a good result distally, uh, no, no, no large dissection, um, improved flow down the SFA. Uh, that left the right iliac, which was treated with a 70 by 29. Uh, balloon expandable stem from the contralateral size, um, which was further post dilated uh, with a 9 0 balloon. Um, so, overall, an improved flow. Uh, four, uh, day 14 of the hospitalization, hospitalization uh, underwent uh, below knee amputation. Um, you can sort of say, I think it was a little bit earlier than that, but post op, uh, they actually went ahead and did a guillotine amputation. Um, cultures and path um, were negative for osteomyelitis on the bone margins, um, but did have evidence of good healing. Uh, subsequently went back for a, uh, a revision of his BKA um, for a definitive closure of it, um, sort of formalization. Um, followed up in clinic with good healing of his amputation stump and was subsequently referred for uh, prosthesis. Um, so sort of a multi-pronged approach to sort of treating this wound. And that's the case. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we're just a little bit over in time. Um, Dr. Shook, do we want to, do you guys want to hang out for a few minutes and hear Dr. Shook's talk that he was going to give up? How about we do that? So Dr. Shook is going to come up, give his talk last year, if you don't mind giving us another eight minutes of your time. He's going to talk about how to dress ulcer recidivism. I have nothing to disclose. I'm going to kind of combine two talks. I'm going to talk about complex salvage cases, and I'm going to kind of intertwine some recidivism. And what I would say, and preface this talk with, is the same things that you look at to take care of limb salvage patients are the very factors that cause recurrence and recalcitrant wounds. So we're kind of look at the four, what I call the four pillars of limb salvage uh, that you really need to hone in on. Now there's multiple factors that have been talked about uh, that are all very important, but these are the most important things in my mind to get these wounds to heal and to hopefully salvage the limb. I, I would address your attention to this article. This, is, this came out from European group. Lipsky is one of the co-authors. And this is a great review article on diabetic foot problems, infections. There's some residents in the room. And I think it's a very good thing to look at. And when we talk about limb salvage challenges, Dr. Carmen talked about this, there's just so many aspects and factors that are involved. You need to be cognizant of all these things. Um, and one of the things that I think you need to avoid uh, we kind of have tunnel vision with respect to wound care. Wound care is absolutely essential and it helps preserve limbs and save people's limbs. But if we just focus on the wound care and become tunnel vision, we kind of miss the forest from the trees. And so we have to look at other things that may be persistent factors in causing an ulcer to persist or a wound to persist. And so we're going to look at infection, neuropathy, biomechanics function, and then revascularization. And this is a 42-year-old insulin-dependent diabetic, type 1 diabetic, 
that had a pretty significant infection. And for me to sit here and tell you that this is something that I did uh, would be a mistake. I helped take care of this guy and I converted him from the left-hand screen to the right-hand screen, but there were 12 other individuals involved uh, with this gentleman's care. So you have to make sure you have all, all your pieces uh, in place in order to take care of these people and get the kind of result that you and the patient want. So here's a case, and I, I show this because you can kind of do this everywhere. I practiced in Pakistan for the last six months of 2014, and here's a gentleman that went on the pilgrimage to Mecca, went to Hajj. Um, it's actually a 40-day process. He came back on October the 5th, 2014, uh, with this. He left with a sub-2 callus, okay? So essentially, he converted a callus to a very severe infection. He was seen by his primary care physician on the day he returned, uh, who was actually a dermatologist, was a friend of the family. He was placed on Keflex. He didn't get better. I saw him about a week later, and I remember these dates because I saw him on my birthday. So otherwise, I wouldn't remember this stuff. So I saw him a week later on my birthday, and this guy was sick. His foot looked terrible. He had subcutaneous crepitation on the top and the bottom of his foot. White count was elevated, glucose elevated. But otherwise, you know, he, he's hypertensive. He had a cholecystectomy. Didn't have a lot of significant history. But here's his infectious process. And so if you go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, this is the entire treatment. We debrided this guy four times. He had wound care for two months after the most recent debridement. And then eventually we converted it into a wound on the top and the bottom that could accept a skin graft. On your far right-hand side was 30 months post skin graft application. So uh, this example is you, you have a very significant infection. You have to address the infectious process very aggressively. And as an example, if you look at the second picture from your left and the third picture, it took me forever to go from picture two to picture three, and the reason is the guy had uh, a septic arthritis in his second MPJ, and I didn't realize that until I debrided him the third time, ended up amputating his toe, and his wound progressed very quickly after that. So you really have to thoroughly investigate these patients with respect to infection and address every aspect of that infection, whether it's a soft tissue process, a joint process, bone or a combination thereof, you need to have ID on board um, to get this thing under control. So now we're going to go, this pa the last patient also had some neuropathy, but we're going to talk about neuropathy a little bit more. This is a gentleman that had this ulcer for about 20 months and had unbelievable attempts at getting this to heal. Uh, he had multiple rounds of antibiotics. Two or three podiatrists saw him, an orthopedist saw him, and so I saw him prior to BKA, and that hole that you see, not only did it probe the bone, I could have taken my fingers and just snatched his medial cuneiform and pulled it out of the wound. So this guy had a significant neuropathy related to a Charcot deformity, and his medial cuneiform was infected, it was osteomyelitic. So he would go through wound care, antibiotics, this would heal, he would stay off of it, and as soon as he walked on it, it would open up again due to the prominent bone and the infection in the bone. So what do we do? We first have to get the infection under control. So we excise the meal cuneiform. Uh, we delay closure about five days later. And we sat on him for about six to eight weeks. Non-weight bearing, antibiotics, local wound care. And we got him converted to what you see on the right-hand side. At that point, now we have to address the deformity. And we have to realign the foot so he doesn't, when he starts to walk again, he doesn't walk uh, on a, a piece of bone that's out of position. So we did a pretty standard fusion. And, and this guy was a great patient, but he definitely scored high on the knucklehead uh, scale. And so the bone wasn't great distally. The purchase wasn't great with the screws and plates. I put a frame on him because I knew he was going to walk on it. Um, but we got this guy to where he healed. This is about eight weeks post-op. Um, and his, his alignment of his foot's reasonable. It's not a perfectly aligned foot, but it's much better than what we started off with. And so I think in most of these patients that you'll see, it's a combination of things. And the first one, infection, was the most important problem. Uh, and this one, the osteomyelitis plus the neuropathy uh, played a part. Now we'll talk about biomechanics. And this is probably my favorite patient uh, that I've taken care of in my career. This guy came in to where I practiced first in Huntington, and I saw him every week. It wasn't my patient, it was one of my partner's patients. Great partner, did everything he could to get this guy to heal. Did wound care every week, he wheeled him in in a wheelchair, sent him out. And so finally, I saw this guy about, I don't know, probably about three years after I initially saw, after he initially came to the practice, I was now in an orthopedic group, and this wound had been healed multiple times, and every time they could get it to heal, they put him in an offloading brace of some sort and it would break down again. Well, this is why. 
Um, he had a fixed ankle valgus deformity. And, and this is what I'm talking about. You can't be tunnel visioned with the wound. You have to explore as to why the wound continues to recur and why there's such a high rate of recidivism in some patients. And, and I think this is pretty self-explanatory. This guy had a valgus ankle deformity that was fixed. Uh, it was a rigid deformity. And there was some question about osteomyelitis. One of the things that you have to understand when you approach this patient, this looks like it's a pretty simple case. You just pull the foot back into, into normal alignment by putting some varus, but the, the problem is uh, the foot's been in this position for such a long time, you have to take the fixation out of the fibula. You have to do a proximal ostectomy on the fibula and then put your frame on, and then you can get your correction and do your ankle fusion. Uh, we also took off a large portion of his meomaleus there was a question as whether he had osteomyelitis there or not, and he's getting an ankle fusion anyway with the frame, so we just tried to nip that in the bud and get rid of it at the same time. This was a stage procedure as well. So the last thing, uh, and this is probably the thing that's the most uh, disturbing to me, and I would say that I'm not as good at, the, as, at this as I should be or want to be. Um, and the other thing I would say that's nice about this program, most of the people that are giving you opinions, mm -hmm. I call them uh, they're, they're the people that write the articles. So you see Bunte and Shishabur are both at this program. Most of the articles that get cited, the uh, speakers are here, and I think that's a nice thing. You almost get like a peer-reviewed opinion uh, when you hear someone speak. And so they reviewed a database of 20,000 CLI patients, and they found that 54,000 of the patients that had a major lower extremity amputation had no attempt at revascularization one year prior. Uh, that's, that's a little alarming. But then when you look at this study, this is a Medicare database that was reviewed for a 10-year period of time. Only 68% of the patients had arterial testing prior to the amputation. These, this study looked at patients for about 24 months uh, prior to the amputation. What's most alarming is this. The arterial testing varied by location of amputation, but it was the worst for foot amputations. And so what I would say to you is a couple of things with respect to arterial revascularization. Um, you have to look at the macrovascular, which is typically our ABI, but you have to start looking at the tissue perfusion, whether that's a TBI or what, whatever you like to look at to indirectly get you some sort of uh, assessment of tissue perfusion. You need to start doing it uh, because just looking at the vascularity, uh, arterial evaluation on 62.5 patients or five-eighths of the time just isn't going to get it done. So here's a patient, last case, and we'll get, get out of here. This is a guy that came in. I saw him on March 16th on the far left. That's March 17th, uh, the, second pay, the second picture. And his white count's elevating, his pain's a little bit out of control. He has diabetes, but the diabetes isn't the huge ish issue. He's uh, essentially a vasculopath. He's got disease everywhere in his body uh, with respect to arterial uh, blood supply. And so we did an amputation, but prior to doing it, I contacted the, the endovascular guy that's near me and said, I'm gonna be sending you someone. We got his toe off, we got his white count heading in the right direction, got him stabilized. And the reason I put these two pictures on the, 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 the right are this. The one that's second from your right is prior to the intervention. So that's on March the 19th. The one on the far right is the one done after the intervention. And I think you can see just a difference very quickly in the quality of the wound. There's not as much wound desiccation, there's some granulation tissue, it looks better. And so after that, I had planned to do a TMA on this guy. He came into the office literally yellow. Um, his creatinine was about 2.5, 2.6, and so his kidneys did get hammered a little bit with the intervention. And so he had all kinds of workup. He had his heart looked at. At the end of the day, his EF was less than 15. His creatinine continued to stay elevated, and he had some liver problems. And so we kind of had to manage this guy in a palliative manner. Uh, he was absolutely not someone that we could take to surgery. He certainly not do a TMA. His coags were off the charts. And so we kind of managed him a little by little, and we got everything to heal. Uh, but I never got the chance to do his TMA, and I was going to do a gastroc recession with it as well. And this kind of goes back to the biomechanics. So now he's lost his EHL tendon, his tibialis anterior tendon is working harder, pulls his foot into varus. He gets a, another problem on the lateral side of his foot. And so we kind of have to manage this locally. We did a local procedure. We ended up taking out his fifth ray and his fifth toe. And, and as Dr. Botex said, I mean, this foot looks horrible. I, I would never want this foot. But this guy now, this is about 26 months post 
inter initial intervention. He has a foot that he walks around on. He wears a surgical shoe most of the time, uh, but I think that this is a save and I'm happy with it. Uh, we didn't do, get to do all the stuff we wanted to do, but we kind of applied the principles of infection, neuropathy, biomechanics, and revascularization in this one patient and was able to get a reasonable uh, result. Uh, thank you very much for having me here this weekend and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.